ascended to heaven and have made uh, a number of resurrection appearances prior to this. This is God's word. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in, in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Amen. Thanks be to God for this portion of his word. Let's have a moment of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we thank you as always that we can turn to your word because that's, that's your teaching to us. Your word shows us how we are to live and is the authority by which we do live our lives. And so, Father, as we look at that these words from Luke's Gospel that you help us in our understanding and in our application, as we ask all this in Jesus, our Saviour's name. Amen. One vital feature of life that is slowly eroding away is the Bible and its significance in our society. Ever since the age of enlightenment, or sometimes referred to as the age of reason, from the late 17th century onwards, the significance and the authority of scripture has been diminishing. Now certainly the Bible still holds importance uh, from a historical and literary uh, point of view, but in terms of being accepted as God's breathed out word. That fact is largely being consigned to the past, to history, and certainly not to today. And that's because the modern mind has reasoned or is reasoning away God. Take for example the rise of secularism and humanism in recent times. The number of humanist weddings and humanist funerals are growing at a pace. I know some of you here have been to humanist funerals. And I've been to quite a few and quite surprised sometimes that the funeral I went to was a humanist funeral when the person who was being remembered had certainly been a churchgoer in their early life. Well, for us as Christians, we have to make sure that we hold firmly to the truthfulness, the veracity, and the necessity of the Bible as God's Word, not only for the past, but for every generation, every generation. The writer to the Hebrews says this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And the hope that he's talking about there is the hope that's revealed in Holy Scripture as a promise from a faithful God, a God for whom it is impossible to lie. And the importance for, of the Scripture for the world is highlighted in our text this morning by the resurrected Christ addressing his disciples before he ascended to heaven. So I want to think first of all about Christ as the fulfillment of Scripture. In this Luke's final chapter, and like the other Gospel writers, he documents the resurrection of Jesus. And uniquely, if you, if you go back to the beginning of the chapter, uh, or just after the beginning of the chapter, he gives us an, an account of two followers who are on a journey to a village called Emmaus. Uh, we only know who one of the disciples was. His name was Cleopas. We were not given the name of the other one. 
But they're on their way to this village, Emmaus, some seven miles from Jerusalem. And Jesus appears. He joins them on their journey. But they didn't recognize him. And a conversation develops with this stranger about the recent events that had happened to Jesus of Nazareth, um, not realizing they were speaking to him, uh, but what had happened to Jesus of Nazareth, and they'd expected him to be their Messiah. But he'd been put to death, he'd been crucified, and his tomb was empty. So what Jesus does is he rebukes them for, for not believing the prophecies of Scripture. Let me read what he says in verse 25. Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ, that is the Messiah, should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And he then goes on to give an amazing Bible exposition or Old Testament exposition. Because in verse 27 it says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And I think that must have been the most amazing Bible study. Jesus, the Word, explaining and expounding all the passages that refer to the Messiah and saying that these were had to come to pass and had come to pass. But it was not until they, they arrived at the village of Emmaus and sat down at the table that the disciples' eyes were opened when Jesus blessed and broke the bread. And then he disappeared. And Jesus then appears to all the disciples in verses 36 and following. And he addresses their doubts and he shows them his hands and his feet. Now according to Luke, Jesus made a number of resurrection appearances during a, a period of 40 days before he ascended to heaven. Luke, who also wrote the book of Acts, he tells us that at the beginning of his chapter. And our text here takes place shortly before the ascension, with Jesus affirming that everything he spoke was in fulfillment of Scripture. Verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And the phrase, the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, that was simply a, um, an expression to refer to the whole of the Old Testament. So what Jesus was doing was he was affirming that everything the Old Testament said about the Messiah was fulfilled in him. Verse 46. Thus it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. So, for example, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, we have got a passage there about, uh, or a prophecy rather, that the Lord would raise up a, pe a person from amongst their own people and who would speak all the words of God. It was a prophecy of Messiah, it was a prophecy of Jesus. In Psalm 16, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, well-known passages, all are prophecies relating to the sufferings and the resurrection of Messiah. In other words, what Jesus is doing here is he is affirming that without the Old Testament scriptures, he would have no ultimate proof of who he was and who he is. And to, to summarize that in today's terms, if you have no Bible, you have no specific evidence of the truth and the authority of God. And sadly, that satisfies many people today because they don't want to believe. They don't want to believe in God. And so, let's get rid of the Bible. But 2,000 years and more on, we still very much have the Bible, even though it may be sitting in bookshelves and libraries, or in, uh, in shops, or is or lost, or under the bed, or somewhere stuffed away in somebody's house. There are 
There must be millions of Bibles out there, many of which are never even opened. And the plain fact is that because the Bible is not at the forefront of our society, God is marginalised. He's forgotten. He's ignored. He's simply not wanted. Well, as Jesus Christ is the fulfilment of Scripture, and as he alone is the saviour from sin, it was not and could not simply end with his ascension to heaven. Because we need to think about the church. The church fulfilling Scripture. That we are part of the fulfilment of Scripture. Because Jesus did not come to only live and die and be resurrected and ascended, and that was it. The Old Testament shows how God, in his love and in his mercy, chose a people to be his own. He chose the people Israel. And Israel was a picture of the church that was to come. God's ultimate purpose, namely that people from all nations and cultures would be the family of God, would make up the population of heaven itself. Remember, Abraham was promised that all families or all peoples of the earth would be blessed through his line. Isaiah prophesied that Israel, and I quote, would be a light for the nations, this is Old Testament Israel, would be a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, we read this, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So the Christian church is the growing population of heaven for all peoples. But the criteria for this family of God is very specific. Now Jesus here was giving his disciples a very specific command. He says in verse 47 that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So, the criteria for salvation for all people, all people, is repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That is repentance towards God, a turning away from my selfish life, asking God to forgive me for my sins, and committing myself to Jesus Christ to live for Him. And that was why Jesus died. That recognizing and believing in His sacrifice secured forgiveness for all who would repent, for all who would believe, and that His resurrection was the proof, the proof of His victory over sin and over death. As Paul says in Romans 10 and 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now Jesus was saying that the disciples were witnesses. He says that uh, there in verse 48. You are witnesses of these things. They were necessary. Jesus had to have these disciples so that they could be the ongoing witnesses uh, for the, the truth of who Jesus uh, was. So they were witnesses to Jesus as the Messiah, being the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And they were commanded, commanded, to proclaim this to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Furthermore, the promise of the Holy Spirit was to be uh, given to them. The Holy Spirit, Jesus had spoken to them about the Holy Spirit that's recorded there in John's, John chapters 14 through 16. And he says there, in verse 49, Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from 
on high. And this is precisely what happened in the Acts of the Apostles. They gathered in Jerusalem, there were 120 of them, they gathered in Jerusalem in that upper room, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. And that gave them the power to then go and be witnesses in Jerusalem. And then when the persecution happened in, in Acts chapter 8, we read that the, the, the church was scattered. Not the apostles, but the church. And what we read there is it's very specific that the people preached the word. That's the ordinary folk. They preached the gospel to whoever. And then, of course, as you read through Acts, Gentiles came into the fold. People from other nations. And so, here we are today as beneficiaries of faithful Christians who proclaimed the gospel of salvation to us. That's why we're here. But it doesn't end there. Because as we have the gospel mantle given to us, we've got to pass it on. It doesn't die with us. But we've to pass it on. And our responsibility as long as we live is to be witnesses for Jesus and his salvation through repentance. But the difficulty that we have today is that the Bible which is our authority, remember that, the Bible's our authority, is disregarded by so many people. So what are we to do? How are we to convince people of the truth and the authority of Scripture? And the plain fact is that we can't. But there's something we've got to do. The key is in what Jesus did for the disciples here and what he can do for anyone. Verse 45. He said to them, uh, verse 45, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Jesus opened the minds of the disciples to understand the scriptures. In other words, only Jesus can help people to see and to believe. And that means, this is where, it's, where we've got to make sure we're obedient to this, the onus is on us to let the Bible be seen and heard. And that is by the truth of Christ being lived out faithfully in our lives and consistently, because that will speak volumes to people. And if people ask you, well, why do you live, why do you live like this? Why do you why do you follow all these things in the Bible? What a golden opportunity to then affirm the truth and the authority of the Bible. And when we do that, we're giving God, if you like, the opportunity to open our minds to understand the Scriptures. So regardless of opposition or ridicule that we might receive, we are called to faithful, Christ-like living. As Jesus so simply illustrated in the Sermon on the Mount by a lamp unobstructed on a stand where he said, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Consider what an awesome and vital privilege has been given to every one of us to proclaim the gospel message. We're not all called to be preachers per se, but we are called to proclaim the truth of God. This is the most important book in all of history. This is the book that everyone needs to hear because this is the only book that tells us about God and the way of salvation. Nothing else does. So when you consider that, what a privilege we have got to share the scriptures. Now we don't have that privilege to go up to people these days and, and simply share the gospel. We've got to kind of earn it. We, people have got to see the truth in us so that they're going to stand back and say, well, why, why, why do you do this? Why do you go to church? Why do you read your Bible? 
Why, why are you so loving to people when they're, they're hurtful towards you? And so on, giving us the opportunity. We have got to proclaim the gospel message by ourselves being living Bibles before the world. What great privilege. So let's make sure we don't disappoint God in failing to be living Bibles. It's in your hands as it is in my hands to simply let the world see Christ in us by the lives that we live. Let's pray. Almighty God, as we have contemplated these vital words of Jesus, we thank you for reaffirming to us the authority of Scripture. This was what Jesus used to prove his Messiahship, and also a reminder to us that our salvation hope rests on the truth and promise of God. Help us therefore to ensure that we not only read your word daily, but that we study it and live out the principles so that we may be the light of the world as Jesus commanded us to be. Help us also to be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have in Christ if anyone asks, remembering also to pray for unbelievers that we may interact with them so that you would open their minds to understand the truth of your word. Thank you for all your countless blessings to us and keep us faithful in our walk with you and the task of being your faithful witnesses. And we ask this in Jesus, our Saviour's name.